Finland, Suomi, or as some Americans say, where? The modest nation of 6 million people nestled in the northern reaches of Europe has earned the title of the happiest country in the world three years running. But if you are only privy to this statistic, listen close, because this eutopia is much more a tale than just the sauna and the sea. Maybe you've sat on an Artec piece designed by the prolific Alvar Alto, or carry your belongings in the Suomi chic sack from Marimekko, staples in the world of renowned Finnish design. You have almost certainly been a beneficiary to Finland's historically thriving tech industry, whether by owning a phone from telecommunications giant Nokia, or swinging foul foul in the farmland feud of angry birds. And we are here talking about it today, because Finland has an enormously rich history in atomic layer deposition. ALD was discovered simultaneously in Russia as molecular layering, and in Finland as atomic layer epitaxy. The work and patent in Finland was pioneered by Tuomo Santola, who also led the initial commercialization efforts. After many decades, Finland now has a number of companies and individuals, like Benek, Picosan, Marku Leskela, Rikka Purunen, working in the field, and it has become one of the more concentrated centers for ALD research and commercialization. So here I am now in Finland, and the 10th installment of the ALD Stories podcast lands me somewhere special. I was excited to have the chance to sit down with Professor Mikko Ritola from the University of Helsinki. Mikko, a professor of chemistry at the University of Helsinki's Kumpala campus, has been a staple in the ALD community since the 1990s and continues to get the field with cutting-edge research today. Professor Ritola was kind enough to give me a tour of his lab where I walked down a timeline of ALD reactors, seeing his collection of F120 reactors from ASM microchemistry all the way to original PicoSun tools, and finally, a Benek TFS200 as part of an enormous state-of-the-art deposition characterization cluster tool. In this episode, Mikko and I connect ALD past with the present and future. We touch on an upcoming special occasion for his lab, how ALD has progressed over the past 30 years, and discuss his lab's work in selective ALD and ALE. The biggest of thanks goes to Professor Ritla for welcoming me into his lab and office, for taking the time to share so many stories and much knowledge with me. So please, grab your tea or coffee, and I hope you enjoy episode 10 of the ALD Stories podcast. Welcome to ALD Stories, a series of conversations where we share the untold stories of atomic layer deposition and the people behind the technology. This podcast is brought to you by Benek, the home of ALD. I'm here at the University of Helsinki Kupala campus with Professor Miko Ritala. Uh, Miko, it's really great of you to join us. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really happy to have you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to the podcast. Thank you for coming to see our, our facilities now once you are moved to Finland. So. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate the, the tour of the labs. I've kind of been missing my time at the University of Colorado a bit. So, um, like I mentioned down there, a little bit less aluminum foil than mm-hmm. in our lab. So, um, but it's really nice to see all of the research activities going on. And, um, we had some really great conversation down there. So, it would be really nice to touch on some of the things we chatted about. Maybe to start off, we can talk about, you have told me you have a big celebration that's coming up in, in a day or two, and uh, you can speak on what is the... the oh, yeah. What yeah. about? Yeah, well, we have a big celebration, actually. It's time to, tomorrow morning, unfortunately, we were not exactly right with respect of this podcast, but yes. So our, our first ALD reactor, which was installed in 1992, is now reaching the run number 10,000. So it's been now uh, almost 30 years in use, and it's yeah, they have now made 10,000 experiments tomorrow morning. Uh, for industrial reactors' point of view, this is probably not a big number, but it's important to remember that these are really manually operated. So two runs per day is a is a kind of a target, but we are we are trying to reach with these ones once they are in operation. And this was uh, what kind of reactor is this? So this is a flow type reactor. So these are those were. The very first commercial ALD reactors ever ever coming to market. So F120 from microchemistry, today ASM microchemistry. I think the production of, of these tools started in 1988, and, and yeah, we, we bought our first one in '92. That's amazing. So it's been this one has been operation set for almost 30 years, yeah. or, or 30 years this year, 2022. Yeah, yeah, I guess it was in August '92. Uh, so it's, and the 10,000 run is going to be what material? Yeah, well, we, the 10,000 run will be exactly the same material as the first run, so right. we are kind of closing the circle. So it's the we were, well, the reactor was verified by aluminum oxide and zinc sulfide. And surprisingly, it's not made from TMA, it's made from aluminum chloride, because TMA mm-hmm. was very little used in, in 92 still. 
do you not use TMA in that reactor at all? Well, we do use TMA in most of our reactors, like everybody in ALD community is <laughs> using TMA, but, but we are still using also aluminum chloride. Well, congratulations on the, the 10,000 for of this reactor. Um, this is the F100. You have a number of these these F100s. They're yeah. reactors I've never I've never seen before. So, yeah, we have we have a good good number of those ones, and it happens to be that this one which we are celebrating tomorrow morning is the only one which we got as a brand new tool. So mm -hmm. all the others they have been in use somewhere else. Quite many of those at, at microchemistry or now AS and microchemistry. But some also somewhere else. So, but yeah, well, somehow they have ended up in our laboratory. We enjoy that a lot. So these are these are very good tools when developing new ALD chemistry. So they are very precursor efficient. So with very small amount, you can you can work out a lot of details out of the process. And you were showing me these sample holders for these reactors, and they were very unlike anything I've ever seen. We usually just kind of you know flow over in a stainless steel tube, but these. Uh, have some very kind of complex um, kind of etchings into these these sample holders and then flow over just the yeah coupon itself. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's uh, they are made from quartz, and what makes them looking quite complicated is that that in in these quartz parts, so there are also these flow channels where we realize the inert gas valving mechanism, so that we can use also. Uh, such precursors which have very modest volatility, so we can heat those up to 500 centigrade to make them volatile. Then you can't use mechanical valves, but with inert gas valving, it's possible. And you, you were telling me that there, because it was so precursor efficient, you were able to develop one process with only four grams of uh, what's a very expensive <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's our example case. Okay, so that's our osmium process. So we, we, we had to be working with basically with all noble metals. Osmium was still missing, and it was Yanni Hamann and our PhD students. So, so he insisted to, to develop this, this osmium process and I looked the price of the precursor. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, so there is no need. But well, he, he keep on asking, and then I said, to him, "Well, you can buy the two grams bottle." And he bought two grams, made what ten runs, so very good results. Said, and I need another two grams to complete the paper. And I said, "Okay, let's do it." And we did it. So with four grams, and one full paper. And have you been using other expensive precursors uh, just because you know you have the most efficient ALD reactors for this? We have been we haven't been using that expensive precursor probably ever because <laughs> because it's so expensive. But but we have been using many other expensive precursors. Well, not necessarily because we have so efficient reactor, but well, because you just have to when you are developing new AI chemistry. And so because you have these tools, they're very reliable and robust and very good at using precursors. You mentioned that they're good for developing new chemistries. Um, do you have some new materials that you have been working on recently that are have been being used in these uh, F100 reactors? Oh yeah, well, we have about 25 people developing new ALD okay. chemistry, so there is a, quite a rich amount, number of, of new pr processes and ma materials coming up so all the time. So it's, yeah, so it's a, if you want examples, so well, what a, what a, so we have new we have just a paper to come out for about new nickel process. We have been working again with gold, some new new kind of approach to what gold. Mm -hmm. There are there are so many things, so it's mm -hmm. quite difficult to start listing through. Sure, artists. sure. Yeah. No, no need to be exhausted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be here for much longer than, than our hour. <laughs> if that were the case. Yeah. Do you, you have twenty five people in, in the lab? We have about 25 people in our group, so it depends a little bit. So because well, undergrad students they come and go, and the number is flexible. But now I guess we are we are abroad. Well, we are calling ourselves Helsinki ALD group, so we are approaching 30 right now. But not exactly everybody is doing ALD, so we have some other activity and mm -hmm. still working on other materials. So. And this is all happening here on the the Kumpula campus. It's everything is here in the Kumpula campus so in, in this chemistry. Chemistry department building called Chemicum. Well, so you, to tie, tie things up a, a little bit here, you have a, a very, one of the very first reactors, commercial ALD reactors from, from ASM. You've been in the ALD community for a while. And um, maybe if you could talk about how you maybe have seen the ALD community change or how, how things have been done uh, you know, over the past, the past 30 years in ALD. 
Maybe that is a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it's another one hour question. But yeah, well, <laughs> well it's a, when I, I well I started my my career on, on ALD exactly first of August in ninety one. So I'm starting to do my PhD research and 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 then well at that time we didn't have a reactor, so Marco Laskela had just started a group in, in University of Helsinki. So I joined the group which was there in Technical University, currently as Alta University, for the first year to learn how to how to use these reactors and, and things like that. So then we got our first own reactor and 92 was also the year when I went to the first atomic layer epitaxy conference. So that was in Raleigh in North, in North Carolina. And, and there are, well, what what's comes up in my mind first is that Almost everything was about Gallimas and another three mm -hmm. fives. There were some papers also about towards silicon and germanium, but it was really kind of an epitaxy conference. Sure. Five last talks, so they were dealing with non epitaxial things. They, I think, was it four out of five were coming from, from Finland. So, so we were doing things that now are the mainstream of AI. Okay. So that, that's kind of my starting point in these conferences, and it's continued like that so during well, the next eight years or so, but then the ABS conference started because semiconductor industry became interested. But, but also in the 90s, because there were quite little atomic layer deposits, and well, we also were calling it atomic layer epitaxy for historical reasons, but only later changed to atomic layer deposits, but because there was so, quite few conferences on, on, on the method itself, so we went, for example, to CVD conferences, mm -hmm. and we were audits there as well. So that, well, always when, when I had a talk about atomic layer epitaxy of titanium oxide, for example, so I knew what were the first two questions. So the first one was, why do you call it epitaxy even if your films are not epitaxial? Mm -hmm. Well, I said, as well, because Thomas Untola named it like this one, and it's, there, there was a reasoning, but that was, well, that was fair enough question. And the other question what came up very often was that why are you working on this method? Because it's so slow, so it's, it's useless. So today's perspective, so that, that question sure. is not so fair enough anymore. So it's, that's kind of a, yeah, well, that's how it's, it looked like in the 90s. But then he said so when he approached the turn of millennium, so semiconductor industry became interested and well, well the ALD community now saw that all the all the curves are pointing to the to the northeast now. So the number of people participating, number of papers being published, patents, markets, so it's it's blooming really very much of course. And yeah, well again back in nineties, so I, I more or less I tried to read every paper which was dealing with atomic layer epitaxis. At some point, I, I ran into a trouble because these papers are piling up uh, uh, more and more on my desk, and it's, uh, yeah, it's the approach how to follow the field has changed, of course, a lot as well. But this was uh, before you were a professor here at Helsinki. So. Yeah, I became a professor at 2003, okay. so it's, it's it's about the same time. So. Mm -hmm. And also in 2004, so we organized the the ABS ALD conference in Helsinki, so it was still quite small conference, but now it's 24, it's coming back to Helsinki, yeah, right. so it's, uh, we expect, but hopefully the pandemic will be over and we will see more than 1,000 people coming, so we have Finlandia Hall that's been preserved by ABS already for that. Do you remember from that ALD conference in 2004, what was the, the big talk, the, the big thing that came out about ALD, or if people were still calling it, Atomic layer epitaxy probably not so much. No, 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 no. There was there was very little epitaxy. So I, that was the time. So when, when there was a lot of papers about high K, high, high K, K oxide. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think it was still maybe a, yeah, I get pretty close to about the peak at that time. So when most of the talks were about high K oxide. So then it after that one, it the the variety of talks has kind of. Like, Increased, so there are well, of course, in semiconductors. So we have now we have metals there, but there are other materials than, than the oxides than all there. And some of the the topics today, do you feel that they were um, maybe we talked about it or were almost uh, predicted at the time? People had a lot of foresight about what might be happening uh -huh. in ALD you know, 20 years later. Well, it depends now what what year we are talking about because. <laughs> uh, for my PhD thesis, so I was working on hafnium chloride water process in 1993. 
without having any idea that for what 14, 15 years later Intel would take that process into production. And I would assume that nobody else in the world didn't know that either. So that it's just, it was kind of, I, I did the research for the for scientific curiosity to see how much that is differing from that to corresponding titanium oxide process. Then the process was, it was made and a few years to fast and then the interest to what that one was increasing. And of course now when we come to the year 2000, so then it, then we could value and we could see the potential value of, of, of our, all our processes we are working on for the future microelectronics. But in 93, so it was too far distant to, mm -hmm. to see it. So. And of course, it's, it's also so that to get the half new oxide from 93 to production, so that required a lot. So it required, first of all, that the industry was buying the idea of, of using this slow, awfully slow ALD method. And, and then when they, well, more of, they started to accept that, so then the reactors needed to be developed to the, to the level as, as required. But through this process, so then industry became ALD ready. And then the following process is developed by us or somebody else. So it was much faster to get into the production well, because well, the infrastructure was there already by the comp in, in the companies. So you were working on some of these materials way back in the '90s that are very that you the word you use main, mainstream ALD mm. now now today and, and in production. Sort of yeah, uh, kind of a partially accidentally, and then when when years were progressing more and more intentionally mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So. So my, my PhD thesis, which I, I completed in 1994, so that was about titanium zirconium and hafnium oxide. Soon after that, so I started working on titanium nitride processes and, and so on. So now I, I keep going, kind of making this a, a bit of a theme here. You have some stuff from you know a couple of decades ago from your reactors and work and, and then some things that are happening today. Now you have these you know, ASM reactors, the F100s, but you also mentioned to me today and showed me in your lab that you have the, the biggest investment in academic ALD in, in Finland. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's indeed how, how we describe it, and I, I'm pretty sure that's how it is. So uh, it's a it's a setup or system. It's it's a cluster, perhaps the best way of describing it, is where we are we are connecting a, a Benek flow type ALD reactor through a load lock to a USB system and in this USB system so we have a we have an, uh, number of surface analytical techniques like XPS, OSER, ion scattering, lead in one chamber and then uh, we have another chamber where we can do, do the temperature program dissolution so that we can, we can, in an ALD reactor, we can stop an ALD process or ALH process at a selected point. Then we are moving our sample from there in vacua to, to the USB side and to this analytical technique to, to learn what is the surface intermediate form and, and what are its, what's, what is its thermal stability, for example. You have some some plans that are coming up, hopefully, for this reactor. Yeah, it's a, we have a plan. So there is, as, as you saw, so there was still a kind of an empty side next to the main main uh, or the kind of a radial distribution chamber, which is taking samples from ALD and supplying to analytical chamber. So there is one port which we have we have a drawing already ready. So how to add a lace, so low energy ion scattering instrument to that port. And, our first uh, proposal to get that funding, unfortunately, got a negative decision, but it's now in the a, in a next round, and, and we'll hopefully at some point we will, we will get that as well. Yeah. Fingers crossed that, that space will be yearning for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. yeah, well, we call XPS and also a surface analytical technique. So compared to those, so LACE is the true surface analytical technique, because with that technique you can really distinguish what is forming the outermost surface layer. So it's, to, in my thinking, so it's the tool one, one should have available for the, for the ALD mechanism, studies on ALD and ALX reaction mechanisms. And uh, this radial distribution chamber has a, a pretty fun name for it also. Is it a nickname? Yeah. 
which is UFO. So, you, yeah. So it's uh, well, you saw it. So I think it's it's quite obvious. So why it's, why it's a nickname? So it's a, it's a round chamber. And, yeah. Yeah. So those who are interested to see how the system looks like, so you you just Google Helsinki ALD and see news there. So there is a video. Two minutes video how the system was put up and also how it looks like. That's great. And you said this became operational just last summer, so it's very new. Yeah, it did became operational last summer. So the well, pandemic was dealing a bit it's its installation, but yeah, in, in the summer it was installed and now we are in a in a learning curve how to how to use it and, and to develop the best procedures. Mm -hmm. So it's a you saw it's it's quite a complicated system, so there are lots of things to do. But it's also something so so with Marco Leskela, so we have been talking about that 20 years and now it was realized, so I said that well, mm -hmm. We have been dreaming about that for 20 years now, we are seeing every now and then nightmares, so how <laughs> things are not going exactly <laughs> in line, but yeah, we are learning. But uh, does it still feel good to have the dream kind of tangible now at this point? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, that's exactly how it is, so that's something you have been sketching on paper, so realizing and mm -hmm. well, the, what you could also, what you said is that, that uh, you, you, you had an, nothing that big in your, your lab in, in Colorado, true. so that was also <laughs> sort of surprising to us, of, wow, it became so large, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it takes some, some space to, 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 to get it realized. And uh, I know you're kind of working through the setting all of it up and figuring out how it works and getting, um, ironing out all of the kinks for the reactor operation. Is that what are your, your plans for the, the work that will be done on this reactor? Oh, yeah, we have multiple plans there. So it's, uh, in, in principle, so you could take every, uh, more or less like every ALD process there and, and to see what new you can learn with, with this, this tool about the reaction mechanism. But what we eventually want to do is that we want to couple back this, this new information to our process design and precursor design mm -hmm. so that we can learn new things about how the chemistry is working and then exploit that knowledge in, in developing new, new chemistries as well. So that's that's one thing, so it, to study the reaction mechanism, so how the film actually is grown. But then what is very important these days also is how the films are integrating with the other materials, with the underlying materials, so and, and, and when, when we're going towards semiconductor devices. So that's, that's another topic we will surely study with this equipment as well. And I said so, even if it's been, so far it's mostly been designed and thought from the deposition point of view, so atomic layer etching can be done there as well. That's fantastic, and is there some, uh, is this a tool that uh, people at Alto and some other organizations around Finland may uh, have some kind of access to or some collaborations with? Yes, so it's, it's, it's really very, we are open for all kinds of collaboration and we have always been open for collaboration, uh, but now this is even more emphasized because our our unit, the, the Helsinki ALD research group, together with, with physicist groups in Accelerator Lab, in X-ray Lab, so we are now a kind of a national, not kind of, a, but we are a national research infrastructure in atomic layer deposition and etching. So that's kind of a roadmap of Academy of Finland where we were selected, and that means that we are servicing also the other users in Finland and also abroad who are needing these techniques and these techniques mean ALD reactors, this new cluster, but then also these, these materials characterization techniques that we have here in, on, on the campus, so ion beam techniques, electron microscope, X-ray diffractometers and so on. So there is a actually there is a big large number of different equipment and, and the way how the external users can approach these depend from equipment to equipment. But the, always the best way to start is to contact me and, and start discussing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I would urge everybody to take a look at the, the video on this reactor. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. And also on the same page is there is a description about this this ALD center research infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's all there. So maybe we can get into a little bit of more specific research that your your group is doing. You know, touch on all of this really cool equipment that you have to actually do the work and uh, kind of the history of what has led up to, to this point and you know, us having this conversation today. Uh, I think the topic that we were going to discuss is, is area selective deposition. And maybe we can you know, first just uh, tell about what is the context of why 
very selective ALD is, is so important and so hot and so topical right now? Yeah, well, it, it all goes back, of course, to the state-of-the-art semiconductor devices where the fields of size is uh, below 10 nanometers and so on. And the way how these drugs have been done is that one makes a blanket film and then one uses photolithographic techniques to remove those parts of the film which are not wanted. And, and this is fine working approach still, but there are some issues and challenges. Now it's uh, First of all, to make so small features, so that's doable. But to do it, so it's a, you use, well, in the state of the art devices, so they are using extreme ultraviolet uh, lithography, which cost more than 100 million. So the next generation, perhaps 300 million euros each tool. Uh, then there is a question also so how to align. So if you have one set of lines here and the 10 nanometers in width, and then you need to land on those exactly. So alignment. Is difficult, so there are it's called edge placement er errors. So that's one issue there. So it's a, now if one could avoid at least some parts of these patterning steps by using area selective deposition, so that one is depositing a film only where it's needed. So there may be, for example, an insulator material and a metal which is exposed because of the device that is being made. Obviously, there must be a preceding lithography step already. But once that has been done, so we have this kind of a chemical heterogeneity there, and if we now are able to develop a process which deposits film only, for example, metal on metal, or dielectric on dielectric, or vice versa, so then we can skip some of those lithography steps, we can eliminate these edge place errors and, and other issues which are, are related to lithography. So it's a kind of a Potentially, there is a big cost savings because of perhaps, well, first of all, increasing the yield of the products and, and perhaps eliminating some of these very expensive little profit terms. With this, this edge placement error, for instance, you know, so we need to align them directly on top of each other. But what is the, the tolerance for this error? Is it some percentage of what the feature size is? Does it get to a point where you know, no edge placement error is at all tolerable? Well, I'm, I'm not, not the right person at all answering this one, so you, you need to go to semiconductor companies. But I would say that, well, we are talking about nanometers accuracy there, so it's uh, what, what is acceptable, what's not. So there are lots of test procedures, and, and it, it's not perfect today, I've seen that, but, but it's, it's good enough. But, but to ensure that it's, it's also so in the future, so that's one, one of these big things, and big drivers for this research. Which I, I think may, many, many, many groups in the community are looking to the same direction. So what's this self-aligned deposition process? That seems to be coming a very, very topical uh, work to be into these days. I know there was a little bit of a selective stuff happening back at my previous lab mm -hmm. at Stephen George at the University of Colorado as well. Could you touch on you know, what are the, the common approaches for doing area selective ALD and what uh, your approach to the University of Helsinki has been? Yeah, well, well, roughly speaking, so we can classify these in true groups so, so that one can either try to passivate certain parts, so those non growth surfaces where we don't want the film growing, we can, one can try to activate those areas where film growth is wanted. And the most elegant is kind of inherent selectivity. So that one finds such an ALD process which is only working on one kind of a material, not, not or the other kind. Which is kind of a very much against what, how ALD in general has been learned to work. So because ALD in general was thought that it's, it's growing nicely and uniform, mm -hmm. uniformly all over. And now we are looking exactly the opposite thing. So if one needs to tune the chemistry. Uh, so to tune the chemistry, so kind of a, it's, well, it's not any more exactly inherently selective process, but one can perhaps convert a normal ALD process with, to one which shows inherent selectivity by adding, adding to the process some additives. So one is talking about small molecule inhibitors. So the idea is that they wouldn't be permanently staying there on the surfaces like, for example, polymers or self-assembled monolayers that are, have all earlier been used in passivation, so they remain there. But these would be just molecules that would be absorbing on one type of a material, block that from the precursors, while leaving the other surface 
free and op open for, for the film code to take place. So, yeah, we are kind of, we are looking these SMIs now, we are looking inherent selectivity. But then we have the new approach also, which is kind of a, it's kind of a completely new idea in, in, in this context, so that's area selective edge. And it's kind of, a, well, if you're taking a little bit looking back, so we, we started with atomic layer deposition, so soon we get atomic layer etching available as well. So now we, people have been talking about area selective deposition. So then I came to ideas so of that could we perhaps also do area selective etching and how could we do it? And it's, uh, it's well, then, then certain things come to, together at the right, in a, in a right way. And, and, and then I realized that so we can develop a process so that we can area selective edge polymers away. So that, again, we need to have a starting surface where we have different materials, but assuming that we have an well, SiO2 and well, where we demonstrated this first time, we had actually platinum there. Then we applied on top of that a polymer film, and then we annealed that structure, so continuous this polyimid film on, on these two kinds of surfaces, so in oxygen at 300 centigrade. Uh, and what happened is that under these conditions, so the polyimid is combusted away from the platinum surface, while it remains intact on SiO2. So it's kind of area selective etching, where the, the selectivity comes from the underlying material. And afterwards, so you can use the, the pattern polymer, either as part of the device structure, or you can use that then for area selective deposition, so that when you con continue, well, what we did, we continued with iridium growth, so that took place only on the platinum that had been exposed, but not on polyimid, which was residing there on SiO2. And at this thing, in, in our thinking, so this opens a lot of possibilities. It opens also a lot of research questions, so how, how sharp edges one can produce with that one. And we are now, we are, there is a work going on to prove, though, that it's, it's the right kind of a polymers and conditions, so it seems to be pretty good. So how, how does this uh, mechanism work then for the addition of the polymers? Is it a kind of dissociative chemistry on the platinum and not on the oxide? Yeah, well, the key idea here is, is, is also you know, what, what, what took us testing this is that uh, the, we, we use reactive, well, we, we create reactive species from molecular oxygen. And, and to activate molecular oxygen, it needs to reach the platinum surface or some other catalytic surface underneath. And so it means that it needs to diffuse through the polymers. But that's exactly the, it's, it's known, a very well known problem when one is, is making electronic devices on polymeric structures because oxygen and other small molecules are permeating so efficient. Now we take advantage of this, this problem so that oxygen is able to go through. So if it, when it permeates through the polymer and reaches SiO2 surface, so nothing happens. But once it's reaching platinum surface, so it dissociates into atomic oxygen, and that is a very highly oxidizing species, so it combusts this polymer away. So it's a combustion reaction. We have also been studying, and to some extent showing that we can do the same with hydrogen. So hydrogen, when it's dissociated to atomic hydrogen, so it starts cleaving this polymer. So it's not anymore combustion, but it's hydrogen or it's this reaction, which is then cleaving the polymer away. And there, surely there are also other possibilities available. So as I said, so there's, there's lots of things to, to study. Is there a way to kind of, uh, do these self-assembled monolayers of the polymer in, the, in kind of different densities, uh, I suppose? So maybe there's, they're not so closely packed and then you could allow um, maybe bigger molecules to, to permeate through to have some interactions with the, the surface. Well, what, what I, I was talking so far, so that had nothing to do with self-assembled model. Right? Oh, they were not, so, they were so, not SAMs, okay. They, they were not SAMs, so it, it's polymer films. So one can make polymer films by many, many ways. So we actually started with molecular layer deposits, polyimid made by that one. But we have also spin-coded PMMA layers on top. So it's. Uh, any, any kind of a polymer film, in principle, could be used. Of course, there, one needs to find the right kind of a chemistry how to, to decompose that away from the selective areas. 
self-assembled monolayers, so yes, in principle one could work also with those, but it's, uh, I would say that in this case it's, it's more straightforward not to use them. Mm -hmm. The selectivity for this process is coming from the surface that, that's under, underneath, underneath yeah. right? Yeah. Is there a way to do um, area selective etching or is there work going on for um, etching from from the top? From the top, yeah. He, well, we are, that's somewhere a little bit further mm -hmm. to do at least there. So now the question then is that if we put something on top and then we, to activate, for example, O2 molecules, so then these atomic oxygen should reach also underneath. Okay, if one adds just kind of a nanoparticles on top, so then yeah, it should work in, it should work in this way. And actually there is kind of an analog from wet etching of silicon, for example, when one, where one is using kind of a, some sort of catalytic metal particles to, to catalyze the reaction and do this, this kind of etching. But it, yeah, it's, it could work, but then it also would mean that then you have this, uh, now because what we, we eventually aim to use as a catalyst is something that is already there. But if you then add a catalyst on top and then you add the polymer layer away, so then that will be hopefully nicely landing down as particles on the underlying material, but it's still it's something one needs to take care of mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. And uh, so with these selective deposition and etching processes, I imagine they're, they're not always perfectly selected. There might be some uh, maybe some nucleation delays or, or something like this for the deposition ones, and uh, maybe some others that I don't exactly know about uh, for the etching processes. But it is there. Oh, I imagine you want perfect selectivity. It grows on one, it does doesn't grow on the other, or etches on one, doesn't etch yeah. on the other. But, uh, is there some tolerance in, in this process for for then a little bit of selectivity, and there are some ways to maybe correct? If it's not perfect, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked because that's where area selective etching can make a major difference compared to area selective deposits. And especially if it's so that you want to use this pattern polymer afterwards for area selective deposits and process as a, as a, as a non growth cell. Now, as, as you said, so it's absolutely true so that in area selective deposits, so often it happens so that, that growth starts also on the non growth surface at some point. And typically, nothing is accepted in this respect, so it should be perfectly selective. But now, once we are doing area selective etching of polymer away, so we can accept the fact that okay, it's, it's while it's completely etched from the areas where that we want that to be etched, it at the same time becomes perhaps well, even if it's 50% etched from the other areas, we still have polymer coverage there. Of course, we need to know how much is being etched there. And, and, but still, it's, it's, it, it doesn't destroy the applicability of this approach the same way as happens in, in the non-selectivity in the deposition process. Typically, what we observe in the best cases is, is that there is very, there's hardly any etching at all, for example, on SIO2 surfaces. There may be a little bit densification of the original polymer layer, but that's about it. So it stays exactly the same thing. So just as long as you take away all of the polymer from, from one area, from one surface, and even if there's a little bit left, that should still then allow you to do the selected depositions, for instance, afterwards. Exactly, exactly. Without destroying exactly. applicability. Yeah, mm -hmm. provided, of course, that the polymer what remains there, so its surface properties haven't been changed in a way so that it wouldn't serve anymore as a blocking layer. But it more likely, it, it, it doesn't change that way. So. So this was pretty recent that you had published this paper on the, the selective etching. Yeah. Um, and where where has that progressed from now? Or can you can you talk about? Well, it's a, it is it has progressed now in, into academic Finland funded projects. So there are two PhD students working on, on these topics. One specifically on the on the polymer polymer etching, and and we will now we are. We are now digging deeper and deeper into the details to know so which combinations, which polymers work here, so how sharp fierces we can get. So we've got collaborate some pretty nice test samples from collaborators from University of Lund that we are right now analyzing the outcome with these ones. And Excellent. And the problem is that now we well everybody when we, we submitted these papers we're asking so how does this scale to one nanometer or below 10 nanometer width well in, in our facilities where we don't have clean rooms where we don't have these 
uh, tools to make that kind of a test devices, it's not so trivial thing to add, uh, to, to reply and, and block. Yeah, we are now working towards that direction. Well, what is the kind of area that you were working on with this, uh, this project? Um, or the, the kind of scale? What kind of a scale? So, yeah, we can easily do micrometer scales by ourselves. Uh, going then to, to below my micrometer, we need help. To some extent, we can also try to use actually cross sections of, of our thin films as test devices. Because, one, well, the day of the you can deposit films which are about nanometer in, in thickness, and you make multi layers of those, and then you make a cross section so you have a line pattern. And then you can use this cross section line pattern as the test structure for de depositing the films to, 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 to see the selectivity. But the problem is then how to apply the polymer on top of that. So we can do, use MLB then to code the cross section, but we can't use spin coding, for example, for the cross section coding. But yes, uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, so even if, uh, if our scale is somewhere above micrometer, so more important to test the, the efficiency of this, this approach is to make as sharp edges as possible. So it doesn't matter actually so how far the metal extends from the edge to one direction and SIO to the other end, when we are focusing so that can we replicate the, the sharpness of that edge as well as its original was formed. How, how do you measure something like that? So how we, well, the typical tool what we are using there is a scanning electron microscope and, and well, EDS there, EDS resolution is not exactly this. That is, is, is not exactly that good for measuring the sharpness of the edge. But the outcome should be so that on one side of the edge we have polymer, on the other side of the edge we have like well, what we in, in our first first results. So we had polycrystalline iridium film, and these are very easy to distinguish from each other in scanning electron microscope images, for example. We can use then our focused ion beam microscope to make cross sections of this, and, and that's one. Well, that's the work that is now going on with these, these higher resolution test patterns. Just a question for my own curiosity. I used some, or I did some MLD and some other nano laminate work with AOD and MLD uh, back in, in my in my PhD work, and I, I saw, and I think many people have also seen this kind of uh, infiltration effect of precursors into polymer, and sometimes a little bit of a. Uh, um, yeah, some incorporation of some metal precursors and things like that into polymer films. And after you do this, uh, this selective etching and then do a deposition, you, you have some kind of contact, I imagine, where you have the bare platinum surface and the polymers on the oxide surface. Mm. Do you see you know, any infiltration into the, into the polymer film towards the, towards the bottom of this other? Uh, no, no we, we didn't see. So I guess to, to where it that happening or not happening, so you would need a TEM and, and a chemical an analysis in that. So, but it's uh, on the other hand, so this infiltration, if that would uh, happen into that polymer that we were using, like polyimide, so you should see that also without this patterning all around. But, but in general, so within the resolution of EDS, so we don't have, we don't find, for example, iridium being deposited into mm -hmm. a polyimide. So. Oh, yeah, I think this, this process is really interesting and I'm hoping to see some more work come from these projects and uh, um, just kind of a, a very rich AOD culture here in, in Finland between all of the AOD groups that we have in, in the capital region and uh, Benic and Picosan and also ASM is, is here in LCP as well and you have a relationship with ASM in your lab, is that right? Yes, yes, ASM. We have we a very strong relationship with ASM. Actually, I need to correct, so I have in, in that one project I have two PhD students and, and third one is working actually in a project funded by ASM, also in area okay. selective deposition, so there are three three working on this one, but but back to, to ASM, so actually, if I can again go a little bit back in history, so it, it goes to microchemistry which was established in, in Finland in 1987, and, and then, uh, well, skipping now some turns in between. So microchemistry was bought by ASM International in 1999. And ASM International at that point, though, they became interested about the ALD technology for semiconductor applications and, and the know-how that microchemistry had 
had developed during its existence of uh, ASM bot, that one it, it was renamed as ASM Microchemistry. It kept uh, operational in, in the ESPO, uh, ESPO area in two locations there, or actually probably only one location which had moved before this, this, this acquisition by ASM. But anyhow, it was running in, in ESPO until the beginning of, of 2004. But then uh, ASM people from ASM headquarters, so they, they suggested so that it would be better to build stronger connections to our group. So we had collaboration already before that one, but to, to enforce this collaboration so that they would move ASM microchemistry to our chemistry department building here. But that took, took place the initiative in 2003 and it was realized in 2004. And since that, so they have been renting space from our chemistry department, so they have converted part of that space into clean rooms, they have their own tools there. They are doing R&D in, in, in their own premises, but they have also been funding our group since 2004, so at the level of four BSc students on an annual basis. And the current contract is running till the end of 2023, so it means 20 years seamlessly for BSc students every year. So that means 40 researcher years in a constant manner from a private company to university. So this is, uh, I think there is no counterpart for this kind of industry academic collaboration in Finland at least. I imagine it's been wonderfully fruitful as well. It's been very fruitful. There are so many aspects. So we, we get from ASM, so we get kind of assignments so to develop this kind of, this, this and this kind of a new processes because semiconductor industry will need those in maybe three generations from the current one. They have been hiring our, our students, so they have been able to follow their progress and then picking up the best out of the best and, and, and so on. Yeah, it's, and of course, it's it's constant funding basis, something which academics always they, they, sure. they look for. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's surprising, I'm, I'm very grateful, so that this kind of a constant funding place is coming from a company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, it's wonderful to see um, such a private company taking so much investment and time into the academic setting, into universities, and a lot is being born <laughs> here in the lab, um, you know, in the aluminum foil, like in mm -hmm. the University of Colorado, for instance. Um, it, it's really great to see them putting so much uh, effort into collaborating with you and your group and uh, the University of Helsinki. Of course, in the in the in the very end, so it's also or in the very beginning, it, it goes back to universities where we are also graduating these people to do these things. We're working together parallel, so we have some things we are doing together, some things we are doing separately. So it's, it's been very fruitful. Well, Nico, I think we have touched on a lot of really great topics here today. And uh, before we kind of wrap up a little bit, is there kind of any websites, social medias, any places where people can go to find your work, you go to find your, your activities? maybe for your own group, for the Helsinki ALD and so on? Yes, uh, yes. I, I think if you just Google Helsinki ALD, so you will find our, our website, so where we try to update our, you find our most recent publications there, you find our news there. We have a Twitter account as well, so where, where we try to be active. So these are those, the most, two most obvious kind of uh, ways how to look what's going on here. And, Everybody is always welcome to contact me personally or our group members. So happy to happy to discuss with people with different about different scientific challenges and, and things related to ALD and perhaps something else as well. All right, fantastic. Are you actively recruiting for new PhD students? Uh, well, yes, we are. We have a rather good balance between so about those people who want to come here and who we can take. So mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah. In in that sense, yes, so it's it's oh. That's how it, it, it's supposed to be in universities. People are coming and going. So youngsters are coming and, and they are done so then they are ready to move, move forward. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much, Nico, for meeting with me today and for participating in the podcast. It's really wonderful to have you on. And thank you so much for the lab tour. It was great to see all the equipment and great things that are happening here at the University of Helsinki. And I hope you had a nice time and please enjoy the champagne for the 10,000th round tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming and it was it was a pleasure discussing with you and, and I hope to see you soon here again. So. You're listening to ALD Stories with Venek, the home of ALD.
To stay tuned for new episodes, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Talk to you in the next one.